Okay, let's uh, get started. How did everything go with Sam on Tuesday? Soft robots, awesome. Okay, so that was part one. We'll come back to soft robots uh, in the very last lecture of the semester. In our last theme here on broadening the reach of an evolutionary algorithm, right? So one of the themes you may have noticed as we're working our way through this course is we're uh, taking a lot of the decisions that we're making by hand and turning them over to evolutionary control, right? So Sam showed you last time a little bit of how to adapt hypernate, a particular kind of evolutionary algorithm to evolve both the bodies and brains of soft robots, which in his case has led to an all expenses paid trip to Japan. Not bad, right? Okay. All right, so we're returning back now to our theme on dealing with open problems in the field. And one of the biggest problems at the moment is crossing the reality gap. We looked at original work back in the 90s about adding noise to the simulator, the Golem project, hooking up our evolution and robotic simulators to 3D printers. We looked at uh, some work I did about 10 years ago on resilient machines where uh, it's hard to build a accurate simulator by hand, so let's use an evolutionary algorithm to evolve the simulators, and then evolve controllers on the evolved simulators. That was the really Resilient Machines uh, project. And then we finished last Thursday, last week, with the transferability approach, where we use this idea of multi-objective optimization. So we don't have just one fitness function, we have two or more fitness functions, and we're measuring the fitness of a controller on our simulated robot, as usual, how fast does it get the simulated robot to run, and how transferable is that controller, which is a tricky thing to do because how do we know how transferable a controller is before we transfer it to reality? So we were estimating the transferability of a controller based on other controllers we'd already sent to reality. That was the transferability project. Okay. We're going to look at one last uh, project in this series today, robots that can adapt uh, like animals. Um, this particular approach, as you'll see in a moment, the advantage is that it's very, very fast. It allows robots to cross the reality gap uh, very quickly. Okay, um, lecture 20 is a little shorter. We'll make our way through that today. We'll start in on the last open question in not just evolutionary robotics, but robotics in general, which is scalability. So everything you've seen in this course so far, we've got one or a few robots doing something very simple like locomotion or object manipulation. We usually have one grad student who sits down and writes a fitness function and creates the simulator and does all the work, publishes a paper, and then done and on to the next project, right? So if we want to have, if we want to design robots that are increasingly capable of exhibiting more and more behaviors, we're going to have to do this at scale. We're going to have to scale this up to hundreds or thousands of millions of robots, and probably we're going to have to involve more than just one grad student. We're going to have to get lots of people helping us design and train and evolve these robots. So in this two-part lecture series on scalability, we're going to look at the crowdsourcing of robotics. How can we get large numbers of people to influence the direction of an evolutionary run? Okay, we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, a little bit about uh, the assignments. So undergraduates, hopefully you've already started on assignment 10. That's one of the longer uh, assignments. And the task that you're going to be working on in assignment 10 is phototaxis. So if, we have, if we're looking at our quadruped from above, you're going to evaluate every controller four times. The first time, you're going to put a light source in front of the robot. Second time you evaluate the controller, you put the light source behind the robot. Third trial, the light source is to the left. And in the fourth trial, the light source is to the right. Okay. You're then going to aggregate these four values that come back in some way. And so the fitness of the controller on the robot here is how well it does on average in these four environments. Who's made it all the way through assignment 10 or most of the way? What tends to happen? <coughs> It gets good at one. So this is, uh, actually, we should probably make a lecture on this. This is another open problem in the field, which is known as catastrophic forgetting. I think I've mentioned this already. This isn't really forgetting in our case, because there's no learning here. But catastrophic forgetting is the idea that in evolution, just by chance, 
your robot might get a little bit better at walking towards the light source when it's placed to the right, but it's not very good at moving in the other three directions. Imagine this hypothetical controller here, which is pretty good at the right-hand environment. Imagine a mutation occurs to this controller, which improves in the child controller, improves the robot's behavior in the front environment. What do you think is going to happen to the child's controller, the child controller's ability in the right-hand environment? Worse. It's probably going to get worse. It's going to forget, quote unquote, how good it was in the previous environment. Yes? So could you make um, the, uh, another, or, like, could you make it so that it couldn't go below what it had originally for that, like the score that it had for that? Um, you could. So the question is, could we somehow restrict it? It's not allowed to drop below how well it did before. Possibly, but by doing so, we might throw away a solution then in which it got better in another environment. So uh, I don't know if any of you remember the old whack-a-mole game, right? The, the, uh, once you get better at one thing, it gets worse at the other. So catastrophic forgetting shows up in lots of different forms, in lots of different robotics problems, in that it's very difficult for mutation in evolution or learning in, a, in learning uh, tasks to get the robot to be better at more than one environment at the same time. It's usually a mutation will cause it to get better in one of the environments and unfortunately disrupt its ability to do well in the, the other environment. Very, very challenging. Okay, we know that. So in assignment 10, we are not expecting you to demonstrate, uh, we're not ex expecting you to demonstrate a robot for us that does perfectly well at photo taxes. It's very difficult to get the quadruped to do well at this task. We're looking for you to demonstrate to us that at least you're on the path towards photo taxes. And what exactly does that mean? Well, I can tell you what doesn't count. You might, for example, show us a robot that walks towards the right-hand light source, and in the other three environments, it does exactly the same thing. What does that mean? You have a controller that just always does the same thing in all four environments. Why might it do that? So we have our light source out here. We've got our four touch sensors in the robot's feet as usual. There's also a light sensor now inside the quadruped. Any ideas? So learn from sensing light that it should just move away. <clears throat> Exactly. Or not sense light at all, right? So if somehow evolution ignores the incoming light signal, then in all four of these environments, if it's blind to the light, the environment is exactly the same four times, right? So one pathological solution is for the robot to just ignore the light altogether and get good at one of the environments and forget about the other three. That's insufficient for assignment 10. So you can usually do a little bit better. So you might get one robot that does pretty well in one environment, and in the second environment, for example, the right-hand environment, it starts walking towards, uh, it starts to walk in the, same, in the same way as it did in the first environment. Maybe it starts to turn a little bit towards the right-hand light source. A solution like this is perfectly fine for assignment 10. You're demonstrating to us that evolution is starting to make some progress towards photo taxes. Another solution that uh, is obviously not acceptable is the robot stays at the origin and kind of bounce around. So sometimes the robots will get a little bit gun shy and say, I'm not going to even try and specialize to one environment because in another environment I may walk in the same way, which is away from where the light source is in that environment. So I'm going to sort of hedge my bets and just stay near the origin. When you uh, code up assignment 10 and you start evolving things, that might be the solutions you start to see, but hopefully evolution will start to make a little bit of progress towards photo taxes. Okay? Any que other questions about assignment 10? Yes, Jordan. This isn't about assignment 10 That's necessarily, fine. but do you think that this controller could benefit from a fully connected hidden layer, or is uh, that just too many parameters? Okay, so that's a great question. Could it do better at phototaxis or could it do better at the task at all with a fully connected hidden layer? 
The answer is yes for some tasks and no for, for others. Okay. There are a hundred different things you could actually do to the quadruped, to its controller, to the fitness function. There are things you could do to improve phototaxis. This is a non-trivial task now. There's lots of things you could do, and some of them you might want to tackle in your, your final project. But for now, just trying to demonstrate to us the rudiments of, of phototaxis. So when you get to the end of assignment 10, you're not really at the end, you're at the end of the beginning. You're now, you now have a relatively non-trivial robot, a relatively non-trivial task, and the question then becomes is, how do you take uh, all of the things we've talked about in this course and bake them in to make it easier for evolution to find solutions to this non-trivial problem? Okay. Any other questions about assignment 10? Anything else? OK, so back to lecture. Uh, let's see, we finished transferability, so we're switching over now to robots that can adapt like animals, lecture uh, 20. And I'm going to start, we're going to watch the video summary uh, on YouTube. It's about five minutes. I apologize about the sound. I think I'll just turn the sound off, and I will narrate this for you. Okay, so this project uh, was published a couple years ago and built upon the Resilient Machines project, which was the work we did with quadrupeds where the machines become damaged. Um, in this case, they're going to look at two different physical robots, the hexapod on the left here and then an arm robot that has to uh, pick up objects and drop them into a tin. Okay. What you're going to see in a moment is, unlike the Resilient Machines project, in which the physical robot evolved simulators of themselves, they're going to start by hand designing a simulation of the robot. So this is before they've deployed the physical robot. And then using this simulated robot, they're going to train a very large number of diverse <laughs> controllers. And what do I mean by diverse controllers? It means they're looking for controllers that produce as different kinds of behaviors as possible. The task here, as always, is forward locomotion. But how many different controllers can they find that get the robot to move in lots of different ways? Here's a nice one down here that doesn't use the feet at all. Yet another example of perverse instantiation. We ask the robot to move forward. The robot moves forward. OK. OK, so they're using one simulator and training uh, hundreds of thousands of controllers. And once they have that large library of controllers, they're going to embed them in a space. And we'll talk about the space in a moment. We're going to go into more details in this lecture. But for now, they're just taking all of these controllers that they've evolved, and they're organizing them in a library in a particular order. Come back to that. OK. Then they have their uh, hexapod, which is undamaged. And here's a controller. One of the controllers in that library happens to get the physical robot to move forward. There's a very large number of controllers. Some of them probably don't transfer from simulation to reality very well. But there are a few in that large library that do. Okay. Then they go in and do a little bit of uh, robot torture, as we tend to do, and damage the robot. Again, this robot, like the resilient machine, doesn't know that it's damaged. All it knows is that suddenly, when it used that same controller, it now gets a very different result. So something has changed. So the robot has to go back into the library of hundreds of thousands of controllers and find one, hopefully, that compensates for whatever has happened. But obviously, it can't go through and try all hundreds of thousands out on the physical robot, right? That doesn't make sense. So it's got to, find, it's got to use a search algorithm to find uh, efficiently search that library for one that compensates for what's gone wrong. OK. And we'll talk about how it does that search uh, in a moment. It's based on an idea called Bayesian op optimization, which we'll talk about. OK. So it picks one from the library. This is the one it picked, which doesn't do much better. You'll see the, um, let's see, let me just back up a little bit. 
The red point over there in the top right, that's the particular position in the library. It's pulled a controller out from that library and is trying it out on, uh, in reality. Didn't work very well. So it puts that controller back into the library and searches, pick, goes through the library again and is searching for a new controller in that library <laughs> that'll do a little bit better. Now it picks this one. Not much better, a little bit better. Third controller, doing quite a bit better. Fourth controller, and it's recovered, more or less recovered its behavior. So hundreds of thousands it could have chose, but within four or five controllers, and this takes about a minute to do, it's able to recover. Question? Um, why would we create this entire library of controllers for the robot to use for yeah. when it has a damaged limb right. rather than just create a new controller with the robot's uh, damaged limb already sort of in place for when the controller is developing? Because then you need to train the controller mm -hmm. and possibly the self-model as we did in the Resilient Machines project mm -hmm. after the damage. Mm -hmm. That takes time, mm -hmm. right? Even with modern computing technologies, it takes a while. And as you saw in the Resilient Machines project, it needs to do, in our case, it took 16 trials to figure out that a leg was missing and how to, how to compensate. So the goal here is sort of the opposite of the Resilient Machines project. On the Resilient Machines project, we said, imagine the robot has all the time in the world and all the computing resources in the world. So think about it and figure things out. In this case, perhaps the robot is in a dangerous situation and needs to recover quickly. Okay, so it's sort of at the other end of the spectrum. Okay, some other compensating uh, controllers. Okay, as you can probably imagine from my description here, the hard thing is going to be how do you efficiently search this library mm -hmm. to find something that recovers. Okay. Uh, in the paper, they demonstrated that this approach is not specific to a given robot. So they took this robot arm, uh, which was working perfectly fine and was undamaged. They then created an unresponsive joint. So they bent it and froze it. So now commands that go to that joint fail. The robot fails to uh, drop the object in the right place. Uses the same intelligent trial and error approach to efficiently search the library. Now the library looks a little bit different in the top right, but it has basically the same mathematical structure, which we'll talk about in a moment. Okay, and after 20 seconds of real time, it has tried out a few controllers from this library and has found one that, that works. Okay, they tried this out with six di different damage scenarios on the hexapod, like you see here, and 13 different uh, situations, or four different types uh, on the robot arm. Okay, and I think the rest of this video is just more examples, so let's come back to this algorithm and look at it in a little more detail. Okay, this is something that animals do quite well. Okay, so again, just as we go through the details, remember what we're trying to do here, the game the robot, the physical robot is trying to play is how few trials does it need to attempt to find one that compensates for the situation. Okay, so they start again with a simulation. This is an undamaged robot, so they build the simulation beforehand. Question? Um, those were following along the lecture. Yes, yeah, yes. Are these in a different are they in a different order? I see what we last time the crab broker. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. I apologize. I should have described that. So the original schedule, I apologize. When I did this course last year, this was a brand new uh, paper that came out. So we covered it towards the end of spring semester last year. And so I changed the order. It used to be lecture 26. I apologize. So if you printed out the lecture notes at the beginning of the se uh, semester, you should find them there at lecture 26. Okay. 
which was 26 is now lecture 20. Thanks for that. Okay. All good? Okay. Okay, so again, they start with this undamaged handmade simulator, and then they're going to search this high dimensional space for controllers. Uh, what do they mean by high dimensions here? Well, you remember uh, right at the beginning of the course when we were introducing evolutionary algorithms, we talked about having a vector representing our genome, and each number in that genome is a, is a gene value. For our purposes, usually, and in this case also, each element of the vector represents a single synaptic weight, right? Um, in your case, sometimes you're encoding this as an S by M matrix, a four by eight matrix, still just 32 numbers, right? So the dimensionality of the fitness landscape is what? So we have this very high dimensional fitness landscape. Each point corresponds to a particular genome, and the height of that point usually represents the fitness, right? So what an evolutionary algorithm is really doing is sprinkling a bunch of points on this high dimensional landscape, and these points are trying to climb their local hill to find high fitness <coughs> genomes, right? So if we have n elements in the vector, we have n genes, what is the dimensionality of the fitness landscape? Close, it's not n. n is the, all the horizontal dimensions, right? And then the plus one is the fitness value, right? So in this case, I don't remember from the paper, but they've got a six-legged robot. Each one has an upper and lower leg. So there's probably something like 20, 30, 40, 50 synapses in there. Each one of those needs a synaptic weight, so they're searching through a 20, 30, 40, 50 dimensional plus one landscape, right? It's a very high dimensional space. So as usual, they do some evolution uh, in there, but they're going to actually reduce this high dimensional uh, search space to a low dimensional behavior search space. So what does that mean? Well, what they're going to do is they're gonna create a controller at random and I'm going to draw it here on the board, overly simplified. They're going to take a random controller, they're going to execute it on the simulated robot, and they're going to observe the behavior of the robot. Let's imagine that we construct just a two-dimensional behavioral landscape, because I can only draw in, in two dimensions. And let's imagine that we look at the, uh, we look at the fraction of time that the front left leg leg one spends on the ground. So as the robot moves with that single controller, what's the percentage of time that that leg spends on the ground? And let's also look at the percentage of time that the front <coughs> left leg sp uh, spends on the ground, zero to 100 percent. Let's imagine that that controller caused the two legs to spend, both of them to spend about 75 percent of the time on the ground as it's moving. Let's bin this space, let's turn it into a histogram. So I'm gonna take that controller, and if this is 0%, 50%, 50%, and 100%, both legs spend about 75% of the time on the ground, so I'm gonna drop that controller into this bin in this two-dimensional histogram. So far, so good? Okay, I now take this controller, make a copy of it, mutate it, Evaluated on the simulated robot, and now the front left leg spends 25% of the time on the ground, and the front right leg spends 75% of the time on the ground. Where do I put that new child controller? Let's call this controller one. Where do I put controller two? Upper left. Upper left, right? Actually, I think. Lower right. So it spent, leg two spent 25% of the time on the ground, leg one spent 75% of the time on the ground. So in this lower dimensional behavioral space, we're dropping controllers into different places in the space, depending on the behavior they generated in the simulated robot. Let's take controller two, make a copy of it, and introduce a mutation. And let's imagine that C3 now, 
moves faster than C2 did, so it does better than the parent in terms of fitness, but C3 also causes the robot to drag leg two across the ground 25% of the time and leg one about 75% of the time. So C3 should be going in this bin as well, but this bin is already occupied by C2. We have two controllers competing for the same bin. C2 had lower error than C3. What do you think is going to happen? Which one gets to occupy this space? C2, because it had lower error, right? I'm sorry, lower, lower fitness. Lower did, I, fitness. did I say lower error? Yeah. I meant, sorry, lower fitness. Oh, then C3 is going to take the spot. Exactly, right? So whenever we create a new one, if there's a competition for the box, we drop the one of higher fitness in that bin, right? Okay, rinse and repeat uh, several million times. I can't remember how many they did. You can go and have a look at the paper. So they're filling up this two-dimensional space with controllers. And in this little cartoon picture here, what do you think the colors of the controllers in these bins represent. So in this example here, this is very low resolution, just two by two. Over here, they have a much higher resolution two-dimensional behavior space. What do you think color represents? Green to yellow is a lower to higher fitness. Green to uh, red, red is color higher. Color. Yeah, that's OK. <laughs> right. Red is higher fitness, and green is lower fitness. It should probably be the other way around, right? Green is good, red is bad. In our case, red is good, green is, green is bad, right? So now, one of the nice things about this lower dimensional behavioral space is you can see the fitness landscapes, right? Or you can see the, you can see the uh, local optima. So you can see, if you think of this now as a contour map, right, where basically the color represents height or fitness, the hills are colored in red and the valleys uh, and basins are colored in yellow and green. So far, so good. So it's, we're still evolving controllers on one simulated robot, but we're collapsing the organization of these behaviors, uh, these controllers from the very high dimensional fitness landscape on the left here to a low dimensional library. And controllers in that library are organized by behavior. If I take two controllers that are sitting next to one another in this lower dimensional space, what can you tell me about those two controllers? What must be true about those two controllers if they're near one another in the lower dimensional behavioral space? Any ideas? I can. Okay. So we have this two-dimensional behavioral space, right? We've generated millions and millions of controllers and evaluated on the simulated robot, and we've gone through this process of dropping them into these different positions. Then I go to some random place in this two-dimensional space, and I pull out two controllers that are sitting next to one another. They're in neighboring <laughs> bins. What can you tell me about those two controllers? They have similar behaviors, right? We don't quite know about the fitness, but we know if they're close to one another in behavioral space, that means that those controllers tend to generate similar behaviors on the simulated robot. That's going to be important, and we're going to come back to that. So far, so good? Question? Yeah, it'll, it's, I'm just sort of thinking, like, is there anything that's really defining that it has to be similar? Like, clearly here, it's yep. obviously it's fairly uh, smoothed out landscape, I guess, but is there anything that, to say that you move one motor slightly differently, all of a sudden it's a totally different problem? That's a very good observation, right? So in this cartoon, again, this is not the real data, okay? In this picture here, they're assuming that behavior, controllers that are next to one another in terms of behavior, they tend to also have similar color which means they have similar fitness in this cartoon. And your question is a good one. Is that necessarily true? Just because they produce similar behavior, does that mean that they have similar fitness? And I'm going to let the researchers answer you. So I'm going to skip to, I, I'm going to, skip to the end of this lecture. And I apologize. I should have organized these slides a little bit better. Here is a real picture of this controller library. 
And before you can digest this, um, we need to talk about this a little bit. So obviously, the picture here of the library is in two dimensions, like I drew on the board here. But it is actually a six-dimensional space. Six dimensions seems high, except when you think about the original 51-dimensional fitness landscape. How do you plot six dimensions in two dimensions? There's different ways to do it. Here's one way that they did it. They're going to take the six legs of the hexapod like we did here. So each dimension corresponds to one of the legs. So in this six-dimensional uh, controller library, each dimension reports the fraction of time that that mm -hmm. leg spent on the ground. Okay. So if we look over here, you'll notice that uh, dimension one and dimension two, as I mentioned, is front left and front right leg. And then we take those two dimensions and we break them into five smaller bins. Okay, so this smaller bin in the lower left here, this contains all the controllers for which the legs spent 20% of the time or less on the ground. Right? This bin over here contains all the controllers for which the front left leg spent between 20 and 40% of the time on the ground, and the right leg spent 0 to 20% of the time on the ground. Okay, so we have these five by five big bins. So we're looking at the first two legs and figuring out which of these 25 bins that controller should go into. And before we drop it into that bigger bin, we zoom in and now look at the middle two legs, dimension three and four. And if you look carefully at this picture, you'll notice that any one of these bigger bins is broken up into a set of five by five medium-sized bins. You can guess where this is going, right? So within that big bin, we're now gonna look at the fraction of time that the middle left and middle right spent on the ground and figure out which of those 20, 25 medium-sized bins that controller is gonna go into. Before we drop that controller into one of those 25 <coughs> middle-sized bins, we gotta do one last thing, which is So we're going to break it into a five by five set of even smaller bins, which you can't see in this picture over here. But over here, those smallest size bins correspond to one pixel. Okay, And in that smallest size bin, there's only room for one controller. Right. So we're really dropping a single controller into a <coughs> six dimensional histogram, right? uh, uh, bins that are organized in six dimensional space. I'm going to drop them in there, okay? And if you spend a bit of time looking at this figure, and it takes a while to do this because you've got to think in six dimensions here, you'll notice that controllers that are close to one another tend to have similar fitness, right? Not always. The easiest way to see that is to look at individual groupings. So right in this bin here, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of hot pixels near one another. Right? So these are controllers that get the simulated robot to move pretty quickly. And they're close to one another. They're doing it in a similar way. So at least in terms of the smallest dimensions, which are dimension 5 and 6, or the, mo the most highly embedded dimensions, those hot pixels are close to one another. Are they close in terms of the other dimensions? So if we look at this particular bin here, which is uh, in 2 to the right and up two bins, do the same thing down here, go over two to the right and up two. We notice that these pixels are actually neighboring these pixels in dimensions three and four, right? And both of those groupings of pixels tend to be hot. So yes, they seem to be close to one another in six dimensional space and they tend to have similar fitness. It's not perfect, but generally speaking, the answer to your question is yes. Behavior, controllers that tend to produce similar behaviors tend to have similar fitness. Part of the reason why is because we're dealing with a hexapod. So if we take a controller for a hexapod, which most of the time has static stability, remember our lecture about legged locomotion. If you take a hexapod and it moves its legs randomly, it's going to move in some direction and get some fitness. If the, you then mutate the controller and some of the legs behave slightly differently, it's going to move more or less the same distance. 
Controllers that neighbor one another in the space tend to be related, right? So we take a controller out of here, we mutate it, which changes the behavior a little bit, which means it's going to be close by in behavioral space. And generally speaking, the child is a little bit worse, and in a few cases, a little bit better than the parent. That's true for hexapods. If you remember back to our lecture on bipeds, not necessarily the case. Right? You might have a biped that takes two or three steps, and then a mutation disrupts the behavior, and it takes zero steps. So my guess, and they haven't done this yet, but if you were to redo this with a simulated biped, I don't think you'd get this nice clumping of behavior and fitness. But who knows? Okay. Again, might be an interesting idea for a final project. Okay, we all good on uh, the behavioral space? Okay, question. Yeah, just to clarify, is this, sure. um, like, are they, are they dropping these, these controllers in the bins in the evolutionary algorithm, or is this an analysis that's happening now? This is the evolutionary algorithm, okay. So this is, um, they named this the map elites algorithm. <clears throat> So map, as you can see, we're mapping these controllers into this space based on behavior. And elites, because they're sort of keeping the most elite elements, right? Whatever controller is sitting in here, if there were any other controllers that tried to dislodge it, they failed, right? So in any one bin, we have an elite individual. It's the most fit of any individual that tried to occupy that, that bin, right? So the evolutionary algorithm is create one random controller, put it in its bin, take that controller, pull it out, make a randomly modified copy, put it in another bin, pull it back out, make a randomly modified copy, do that 10 million times, and you get this picture. Okay. So the end goal, like, with a robot that has maybe like a lot of information, right? And then like, given uh, it has some function that can check its damage, I guess, and then it can pull up a controller that can still make it function. Okay, so we have a physical robot that's attached by Wi-Fi to a supercomputer that's got yeah. this set of yeah. controllers, for example. Yeah. Exactly. So it can't check its damage. The robot doesn't can't sense the fact that something has has occurred. All it senses is that it was moving perfectly fine before. It has a sensor that detects velocity, for example. Right? It knows that it's walking perfectly fine. Suddenly, its velocity drops, and it's no longer moving. Then it goes to look for a compensating controller. But couldn't, if these robots, I don't know, are they not proprioceptive? Like, couldn't, couldn't you have some function that says, OK, move all your joints back and forth and see if they work? Uh, you could do that. So you're asking about diagnosis. So there's yeah. no diagnosis here, right? The robot just says, something has changed. I don't know what it is, I don't care, I'm just going to go look for a compensating controller. You can, and there are approaches where you might want to do some diagnosis. It might matter that you discover what's going on. One way to do that, as we saw last week, is in the Resilient Machines project, where it adapts the self-model until it reflects reality, and then by looking at that self-model, either the robot looks at the self-model or the human operator does, they can see what's wrong. Or alternatively, like you said, the robot might individually try and move the motors and sense locally where the problem is. Right? That's also a, a valid approach. The problem with that that makes roboticists nervous is what if the diagnostic sensor itself is broken? Right? So if you can go down the route of trying to put sensors all over the robot to hopefully detect anything that goes wrong, but you've added in some additional complexity to the physical robot. It's got more sensors, and like any machine, the more parts that you add to it, the more things that can possibly go wrong. There are diagnostic sensors of diagnostic sensors, right? Yeah, but I mean, it's hard have, to recover from that. We, from we that also pattern. have things today that like, if they break in a certain way, they have to go in. That's true, exactly. Right? So it's probably, if this was a real world deployment, it would be some combination of a lot of these, these approaches. Question. So here they're like breaking the robot and seeing if they can find a new way to move. But it's like as quickly as possible. Could yep. this also apply to oh the environment changed? Uh, and like because it seems like it doesn't really it doesn't know that it's broken. It's just picking something up. Now you put like a pebble under one foot, or now you're going uphill. Maybe one of the random controllers could actually yep. help in a different design, even though they weren't really. 
So that's a really good observation, right? So from the robot's point of view, again, thinking about thinking is misleading, we might think of these as very different things, right? The robot is damaged, or the robot moves from flat ground onto an incline. Both of those things may cause the robot to slow down or stop. But does it matter from the robot's point of view? It can, process, it can probably use exactly the same algorithm, and whatever controller compensates, compensates. Doesn't, doesn't matter. Do we have like a definitive answer of whether it's better to, like, to evolve a controller that can handle more situations or to evolve a controller that's higher than the controller that handles the situation? Okay. Do we have a definitive answer to um, do we evolve a controller that's just a generalist that can deal with a whole bunch of solutions, or is it better to just evolve specialist controllers on the fly to deal with current circumstances and selecting one? The answer is no, we don't have a definitive answer. We don't have a definitive answer for any of the questions we've looked at in this section, right? These are open problems. So machines uh, fail to transfer <coughs> controllers from simulation to reality. Machines become damaged. Machines move from one environment to the other. What's the best way to handle it? No one has a good answer to it. What we're looking at in this section is just different ideas, right? Things that have been proposed in the literature. Yes? Can you go over again how, uh, how the robot chooses a controller and then, okay. then keeps choosing new ones? Yes, so we ha actually we haven't gone over that yet. So we're still, a, we're, we're still in, in phase one. Create the simulator and generate all these controllers. How does the damaged robot know among this 10 million or so, these 10 million or so controllers, which one will compensate? That's that's next. Okay. So let's let's have a look at that now. So I'm just going to back up again. Okay. So we have this high-dimensional space. We now know what this low-dimensional behavioral space looks like. And again, to keep things simple, we're just going to look at this in two dimensions. But remember, it's actually six dimensions. Okay, so we got a behavioral space, and then we also have above it a confidence space. Okay, what is this confidence space? Well, what this in this confidence space, it is also a six-dimensional arrangement of bins. Okay, so for every single controller in the behavioral space, there is a corresponding bin in this confidence space, and there is a single number in that confidence bin, which is the confidence level, and that number is the physical robot's prediction about how well that controller in the corresponding position and behavioral space will transfer from simulation to reality. So we've got 10 million controllers embedded in a six-dimensional space, and 10 million numbers distributed in another six-dimensional space where those numbers represent the robot's guess about how well that controller will transfer from simulation to reality. So far, so good? Yep. Is that just transferability? Even if it's a terrible controller, it will do exactly the same thing? It's, it is very much like what we just saw in the transferability approach. Some of the authors of this paper worked on the transferability approach. So this is sort of bringing that idea into this method. In this cartoon here, all the confidence levels, all the pixels are all dark blue. What do you think that means? We've got our simulated robot here. We've generated controllers for it. We haven't sent any of them to reality yet. What does dark blue represent? It's a very conservative robot, right? It says, I don't think anything is going to transfer. So the authors have learned from the previous project, right? Best thing to assume up front is that nothing is going to transfer. These are also known as prior probabilities. So as you may have seen in the video summary, we mentioned Bayesian optimization. So this is a particular approach to statistics. We're not going to go into Bayesian optimization today, but we're going to draw on one idea, which is a prior probability. Before anything happens, the robot prior to deployment makes a guess about how well things are going to, all, how well everything is going to transfer to reality, and its guess is nothing's going to transfer. Yes. So is the same thing Yes. Yeah, absolutely. If you're familiar, you as I continue, if you're familiar with Bayesian processes and Bayesian <laughs> optimization, you'll see some similarities in this. Okay. So now we've got our physical robot. It's got to pick something. It's got to pick a controller and transfer it to reality. Which one does it transfer?
So you've got 10 million to choose from. So if the library was set up according to what percentage of the time each limb is used, yes. and we're assuming a limb is broken, it seems like we want to... Don't assume a limb is broken. We don't even know that the robot is damaged yet. This has all happened before we've even deployed the physical robot into the field. We've done all of this. We've built our physical robot. We throw it into its physical environment and say, go, do what we want you to do, which is forward locomotion. And it's got these 10 million controllers. Which one does it pick? Pick the one that you think is going to be best. Exactly. So in this space, there is one controller among these 10 million that has the highest fitness. If, if you guess that all of them are going to transfer badly, you might as well hope for the best and send the one that has highest fitness. OK, so that's what they do. Um, and again, in this cartoon, they're sort of skipping a few steps. But let's imagine the robot is already damaged. OK, so they took the controller that worked best on the intact simulated robot, and they transferred it to the broken physical robot. And they took it and transferred it to the damaged robot, and it did pretty poorly. They, the guess about fitness was wrong. It transferred to reality poorly. So what happens at this point? They're going to update the fitnesses in the behavioral space. So what was a tall red hill before gets pushed down and becomes a low green valley. You'll notice that they didn't take just the pixel and pull that pixel down and leave the rest of the red hill intact. They pulled neighboring pixels down as well. Okay? So what they actually did is to place uh, a, Gaussian strip, uh, a Gaussian around this point. So what does that mean? It means that points that were closer to the controller that failed got pulled by a further distance down. Right? The closer you are, it's assumed the more similar you are to the one that failed. So you will probably also similarly fail. Right? So they've made a change in the behavior landscape, if you like. They've killed this hill. They've also made a change in the confidence space, right? and also with the Gaussian. But they haven't pulled it down. They've actually heated things up. So they've taken this uniform blue plane and they pushed a red hill up at that point in the confidence space, which seems a little bit weird, right? In the behavior space, they were depressing and creating a valley. And in the confidence space, they were pushing up and creating a hill. Why are they creating a hill in the confidence space? What does that mean? Um, well, I'm just trying to relate it to a model of control. They have okay. confidences, and they want to minimize the confidences in the uh, behavior. Um, minimize the co Not quite. Not quite. It's transferred the best out of it so far. It's transferred the best uh, of any so far, that's true, which is pretty poor. And I think, I apologize, I think I missed, I, I didn't describe this confidence level, this confidence space well. It's not a prediction about how well things will transfer. It's the confidence in the robot's prediction. I'm sorry, I, I, did, I didn't describe that right. So confidence in, in your guess. But the guess is this. So something that's read here worked well on the simulator, and it's going to just assume it's going to transfer well to reality. I apologize. A couple questions. Well, yes? Oh, it was a question. It was just oh. extending off of OK, yeah. that's OK. Sorry, Go ahead. I, uh, yep. Just because uh, it, it pushes up uh, yep. in the confidence level or, uh, around, uh, uh, sorry, it's corresponding behavioral that, that's right. uh, two-dimensional um, matrix, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but it's allowed to sort of permeate with that hill that pushes around the area <clears> around it, because all of the behaviors are similar around around that controller, correct? That's right. Okay. Exactly. Can you just repose the question? OK, let me, before I repose the question, let me make sure I've fixed everything in your mind here. OK, so the confidence space, as the name implies, is the robot's confidence in its prediction about how things are, how well things, or poorly, things are going to transfer from simulation to reality. So the uniform blue plane is uniform low confidence. It says, I don't know how well or how poorly things are going to transfer from simulation to reality. The color in the behavioral space is its prediction about how well things are going to transfer from simulation to reality. 
It says, this controller did well on the simulated uh, robot, and I think it's going to transfer well to reality. It's the same thing. Better it does, the robot is sort of a naive optimist. It says if it works on the simulator, it's going to work in reality. I have low confidence in that, but that's my prediction. So far, so good? OK, a couple more questions. So um, why does leveling that hill make the confidence go up? Because like, yeah, you, you've like got rid of something that was kind of a problem, but yep. it doesn't mean that it's, you still don't know that it's going to work. That's true. So what's happened here now, hopefully, if I've corrected things here, the robot's confidence has okay. gone up that things around here will not transfer to reality well. So heat in the confidence level coupled with coolness in the behavioral level means I have high confidence that these things don't work. I have low confidence everywhere else still. So far, so good? Yes? Does it pick its next controller with a Poisson probability? Uh, close. What it's going to do is, how does it pick the next one? What it's going to do is to take each value in behavioral space, which is fitness, and multiply it by the confidence value. Right? So a very high number here multiplied by a very low number here generally kind of cancels out. So it's going to avoid that space. Right? So it's going to pick this point next. Right? This point is pretty good multiplied by this small number. But this number is higher than this number, and this number multiplied by the same low number is a higher product. So it's going to pick that value. So the way it picks the next, uh, the way it picks the next controller is to take each of its predictions, the level of heat in the behavioral space, and multiply it by its confidence in the confidence space. Which, for those of you that are familiar with Bayesian inference, gives you a posterior probability. Right? It says, OK, away we go. I'm, I'm not going to bother in this space. I'm pretty sure that everything here doesn't work very well. And I don't know about everywhere else, but still, in the absence of any other confidence information, I'm still going to just pick the best one. The best one is far from where I was before. It's a very different controller, so maybe I'll get lucky in this case. So far, so good. Okay, so let's say it does take this controller and tries it out, and that controller also fails. So it pushes up its confidence that controllers in this region are not going to do very well. And as it starts to do this a couple times, you can imagine that it's sort of pulling up hills and pressing down depressions. It's warping these two six-dimensional landscapes until eventually it starts to find places nearby where things control, uh, things transfer pretty well, and so its confidence goes up. So values in the behavioral space maybe are mediocre, so they, they were still hills, but they were pushed down by less, confidence went up, so you still have two relatively high values, which means that the robot is now going to start to pick controllers nearby. It says, aha, I'm starting to get warmer literally, right, in the pixel colors here. I'm in a space where I have high confidence or increasing confidence about how things transfer, and things are transferring not too badly around this region. So I'm going to start to zoom in on this, this area. So if you go into the paper and actually look, and they have some of these trajectories. Actually, I think I have one here in the, paper, in the slides. Here we go. So what you see on the right there, this is it moving around in this fitness landscape, or sorry, in this behavioral landscape and zooming in on places where there is high confidence about high transferability. So by using this Bayesian approach, where it's balancing its search among these, this set large library of controllers based on performance and its own confidence, and using the assumption that controllers that are nearby have similar behavior, similar fitness, and similar transferability, which generally speaking, at least for this robot, tends to be true. It's able, with four or five trials, to narrow in on one controller that transfers well from simulation to reality. Do you really map? <clears throat> so when, a, when the robot experiences a behavior, it, it does this process. Yep. 
figures it out, gets its optimal solution. Do they record that and then make a distribution out of those behaviors? And then if it has experiences it again, can pull from that distribution? Do they make a distribution from that controller they found that transfers well? No. Nope. They just are going to use the controllers they already have, right? They're trying to do this very quickly. This is uh, an algorithm that's running on, uh, is, is running on a rover uh, on Mars and the robot is sliding down the side of a, a crater, right? Something is wrong, the accelerator is reporting increasing acceleration. The robot has to do something to stop its acceleration. It doesn't have time to fool around and figure something out. It's got to, within between 30 seconds and a minute, find among a large library of controllers it already has something that'll stop the problem, right? That's the idea here. Okay. Okay, so as you saw in the video, uh, they wanted to test the generality of this approach. So they had this one library of 10 million controllers, and they ran that library against six different physical robots. Same robot, but with different damage. Did it six different times. And this is what they got. So here are the six different uh, damaged cases. The star represents the behavior of the damaged robot. So this is the height of the, the star represents how quickly it was moving, walking speed. And the error bars here, the purple bars, represent those four or five controllers that they tried out after damage. And you can see that all those bars are significantly above the stars, showing that the damaged robot is able to start moving again quickly after a relatively few number of, of trials. Okay. Over here, they took just two of the damaged cases. Or sorry, one of the damaged case is no damage at all, C1, and C3 here. And they used an alternative descriptor. So what is the alternative descriptor? Well, over here, I described one descriptor about how to create this low-dimensional behavioral space. Let's for example, look at the fraction of time that the six legs spent on the ground. You could pick an alternative descriptor. You could say, what's the angle of the body as the robot moves, right? How much does it turn to the left, for example, and how much does it turn to the right over one trial? You could pick a different description, right? Perhaps the description is, what's the height of the robot's body as it's moving? The percentage of time that the leg spent on the ground was reported by the touch sensor. You could take the proprioceptive sensors and create a different six-dimensional space or a four- or eight-dimensional space that's based on proprioception rather than touch. So if we create an alternative descriptor, which is like an alternative way of organizing our library of controllers, does it still work? Or did they get better? Is there just one descriptor that works well for this hexapod, hexapod under these uh, damaged cases. So it turns out that at least for this other descriptor they looked at, the algorithm still works. So they're demonstrating that their algorithm is, is sort of agnostic to the description. It doesn't really matter what description you pick, it still works. And then as you, again, as you saw in the video, um, sorry, last thing, oh, and then so this is the same data here. Now they're plotting um, the adaptive time on the left here, so it took between you know, less than a minute to two or three minutes to recover. And it took three, four, five, in some cases up to 18 or 20 trials to recover. Still pretty good. It's a pretty fast algorithm, relatively few trials. Okay, as you saw in the video, they also tried this out with a different robot to show that their algorithm wasn't just specific to the hexapod. They looked at different kinds uh, of damages and got more or less the same result, that the arm robot could adapt and compensate for the damage but in less than 30 seconds most of the time. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so that ends our lecture on robots that can adapt like animals and that finishes our theme of crossing the reality gap. We'll switch now in the last 15 minutes here to dealing with scalability. How do we scale up the evolutionary design of robots to very large number of robots in lots of different environments, lots of different damage scenarios, changing environments, changing fitness functions? 
As you can tell by now, even for one robot with one fitness function in one environment, there's a lot of effort that goes into it, right? It's taken the undergraduates most of 10 weeks to get to this, this point, right? It's very labor intensive. How do we automate a lot of this stuff and try and scale it up to non-trivial robots and non-trivial tasks? Okay, as I mentioned, we're gonna look at two different projects. These are both projects that came out of my group. Um, we're going to look at, I see now I did this wrong, I apologize. <laughs> Lecture 21 is actually Twitch Plays Robotics. Lecture 22, which we'll look at on Tuesday, is the DotBot project, okay. So, Lecture 21, Twitch Plays Robotics. Okay, um, I'm not, I don't have PowerPoint slides for this. This is actually a PDF, and this is a presentation given by, and this is gonna run ahead for me, okay. Stop. This is a presentation that was given at a conference by Joey Netzberger. Uh, Joey was a student who took this class four years ago. Um, she started on this as her final project and turned it into a conference paper, very successful final project. Um, we're gonna walk our way through that. The project is called Twitch Plays Robotics, and we'll talk about why it's called that in a moment. But it was designed, again, to try and scale up robotics and to scale up robotics in a particular way, which is to tackle the language problem, which is also known as the symbol grounding problem. We'll talk about that in a moment. So if we want to scale this up and get hundreds and thousands of people to help us evolve robots, we're probably not going to find average people out on the web that are able to write down uh, a nice fitness function for our robots. Our users are probably going to want to speak to our robots in plain English. So in this case, how do you evolve robots to understand English? How do you get them to tackle language? Which again is a building block of intelligence. And on purpose, I've left that until this lecture. Right? We've looked at lots of different building blocks of intelligence. One of the biggest ones, at least from a human-centric point of view, is language. How do we teach robots language? So the problem, big problem is scalability. The more specific problem is how do we teach robots language? so that lots of different people can uh, give fitness functions in the form of plain English and scale this up to millions of robots and millions of people. The answer about how to do that is the Twitch Plays Robotics project. But let's talk about this problem in the first place. We have already touched on language. You may remember the Chinese room problem from the first or second week uh, of classes. The Chinese room problem was a rebuttal by John Searle to Turing, where Turing said the definition of intelligence, it's impossible to write down a definition of what intelligence is. All you can do is operationalize it. All you can do is put a robot or a machine in a box and have people talk to it. And if the machine can talk back and convince the person that it's not a machine but another person, it's passed the Turing test and it is intelligence, right? You've all asked very good questions. We've had some interesting conversations in this class. As far as I can tell, you're all intelligent individuals, right? That's actually the metric we tend to use for, for measuring intelligence in the real world. Why not use it for machines? Searle said it's not good enough because you could have a machine um, sitting inside the Chinese room that receives uh, questions in Mandarin and does this mindless lookup table or uses this mindless lookup table to erase the Mandarin characters and replace them with new Mandarin characters, uh, put it back out uh, the slot in the door and the Mandarin speaker on the outside read this perfectly cogent response to their question in Mandarin and the people outside the box conclude that whatever is inside the box, who or whatever it is, has passed the Turing test and therefore it is intelligent, right? However, where is the intelligence inside the Chinese room? Okay, we're not going to revisit that argument, but just to refresh your memory, that's where we are with language, okay? And the Chinese room problem and the Turing test actually influenced the early days uh, of AI. And one example um, from the early days of AI that we didn't talk about at the beginning of the semester, but it's relevant now, is the Psych project. So Psych um, and it's still going. You can go and have a look uh, online about the Psych project. Psych is a machine that is trying to pass the Turing test by basically reading the internet, all of it, 
And before the internet, it read uh, news groups and bulletin boards and then magazines that were manually scanned in by Lenat and his students, it was to basically read everything ever written by humans and see the common patterns in what humans write and sort of distill down those rules into combinations of predicates or these little pieces of speech. So here's an example of uh, three predicates. Is a Bill Clinton, United States president. So if Psych reads enough uh, text from the internet, it will, it will figure out that these two things, whatever these two things are, tend to be related to one another by this third predicate, is a. It doesn't know what is a is, it just knows that is a describes the relationship between this predicate and that predicate. And if it learns enough of these things, it will pass the Turing test and be intelligent. Are you convinced? Hopefully you've been sufficiently infected with embodied thinking that this somehow doesn't seem very satisfying. Uh, it is a little bit different, but it's almost um, a little bit reminiscent of like, um, sometimes someone will ask some big like open-ended question that's very simple. It's like, what does it mean to, to be a president? And okay. Like that. Everyone's like dumbfounded. And it could be kind of like that where like we've sorted things like that, like we've sorted the is a relationship our whole life, but we never really thought to define it that same thing. We haven't thought to define what is a is, we just know that Clinton is a president, this is a oak is a tree, this is a, we just come up with examples, right? You're right, sometimes we're stumped to actually describe what is a is, right? We can give examples, and maybe that's good enough. This thing where the monkeys on the keyboard writing Shakespeare example, I guess you give it enough time, I guess you give it all those freaking... Monkeys on a keyboard typing eventually the Shakespearean plays or someone laboring away in the Chinese room, eventually, if the internet is big enough, these machines will be able to fool us, possibly. Comment? Uh, Question? Okay, I guess uh, a potential counterexample to okay. be like uh, colloquial speech, or if someone misspells something, Maybe. Uh, or if their grammar is bad, then they will not have, you know how to respond to that. Exactly. You can't find that combination of predicates anywhere out there on the, the internet. Most state-of-the-art chatbots are some version of this. Okay. Let's hold on to that thought for a moment. <clears throat> okay. That way of thinking has sort of followed us all the way from the early days of AI to the current day, where we have now deep learning algorithms. And I'm not going to describe deep learning in a lot of detail, but you should be able to recognize this picture by now. We have a neural network with inputs on the left and outputs on the right. In current approaches, we take an image from the web or a video from YouTube, break it down into its component pixels, and push those pixels into the input <laughs> of the deep learning method. And what comes at the output, we treat as a category. The neural network makes a prediction, usually in plain text, about what is in the image. If it's correct, like in this case, we make no changes to the synaptic weight the synaptic weights in this network. If the output was box, or cat, or Bill Clinton, or what have you, if it's wrong in its prediction, then we carefully change these weights until it does output cylinder. We actually mentioned this again when we talked about neural networks, this idea of back propagation of error. We're gonna try and change the weights when it makes a mistake, we'll leave the weights alone when it's correct. And if you do this long enough, if you do this long enough, it will learn to correctly predict uh, images in, uh, it, it, it will able to correctly label objects in an image. Now does a deep learning algorithm, which is able to do this, does it understand cil cylinders any better than Psych understands Bill Clinton? Or the man in the Chinese room understands Mandarin? I don't know, okay. It's not embodied. We don't really know how humans do this. Maybe this is really what we're doing, right? The, the jury is still out on that. However, there is evidence from neuroscience that says probably not. And the argument goes like this. We'll finish with this argument today. Inside your brain, uh, right about here, where you might uh, have the strap of earmuffs, is your motor strip. And if you're put in a uh, brain scanner, 
and you're asked to tap your fingers or tap your toes, different parts of this motor strip will light up. So whatever is controlling the motors or muscles of your body tends to be localized in this part of the brain. And it turns out um, that it's very specific, and this motor strip contains what's called the cortical homunculus, this little man or little woman uh, that lies along the motor strip. And what's amazing about the motor strip is that on one part of it are your toes. So if you wiggle your toes, that part of the motor strip lights up. If you tense the muscles in your leg, the next part of the motor strip uh, lights up and all the way up to uh, your face and mouth and tongue. So there is actually embedded in the motor strip or your, the commands that go to the motors are organized lengthwise from toes to face. Kind of interesting. As you can imagine, there's some great images on the internet of the cortical homunculus. You can go and have a look. Um, in this cartoon, some parts of the homunculus are bigger than others. Why? Sounds like either we uh, have smaller receptors and send them nerves in our hands, or like we we'll use them more often. It's more exactly. important to our survival. Like we can just immediately put it on out here if I'm kicking something, or if I need to like light something. Or Exactly. So the bigger places here represent more sensitivity. So you can kind of see it in this cartoon, but usually in the cortical homunculus, the palm of the hand is bigger than the back of the hand, right? You have relatively little sensation in the back of your hand. It's harder to localize where you're touching than if you touch the palm of your hand. There's much more sensitive information there. Why? Because there's more to sense with your like, yes your hand. I challenge you to try and pick something up with the back of your hand not so easy to do right evolution set our physiology and that part uh, the, the sensation that part of the body is not as important for grabbing fruit or manipulating a tool or a weapon right very very important okay so that's the mo motor homunculus which has nothing to do with language this is just the motor strip okay the the part of your brain that is the puppeteer that controls you there was an amazing paper back in 2010 by Fulton Miller and Fadiga here that found that there is an interesting relationship between the motor strip and language they put people in a brain. Uh, they put someone in. A, put, put people in an MRI and a brain sca a brain scanner, and these people just listened to di various words: talk, lick, grasp, pick, walk, kick. Okay, and it turns out that when they heard these words, the auditory part of the brain lit up, as you would imagine. They're listening to words, but so did the motor strip. So as you were hearing these words, the part of the puppeteer, the part that controls your body was also lighting up. Not only was the motor strip lighting up, but when you heard face related words, which are green related words, the face of the cortical homunculus would light up. When you hear arm related words, the arm part of the homunculus would light up and blue the leg-related words, the leg part of the homunculus would light up. So there is some fundamental connection between action and language, which is looking good to us as students of embodied cognition. There's a fundamental connection between these. And why that matters for robotics in the Twitch Plays Robotics Project, we will talk about on Tuesday. Have a good day. Uh, you have a quiz due to, uh, tonight. Work on assignment 10 because it's one of the longer assignments. Get a, get a jump on that if you haven't started already. Thanks very much.